All right, now what we're gonna do here is have a, kind of like a little living room conversation. Uh, this is Dr. Lyons, and I'm Dr. Noonan. Yep, that's right, we do applaud. And we're gonna be chatting here with uh, Dr. Mead, who as you know, has been with us this week. And we're just going to ask him some questions. Some of the questions are ones that you've asked throughout the week. Uh, some are ones that are follow-up questions uh, that we have and we think uh, you would like to have asked. Uh, we're especially gonna try to focus on some uh, practical aspects of what we've talked about this week and try to get at, okay, why does all this matter? You know, what, so what? We're gonna ask that question. But before we get into to summary, I thought it'd be helpful for us to just think about the big picture. You know, if I asked you to summarize in a sentence or two why all this matters, you know, we, we've got people here who aren't academic like yeah. you. Yeah. You know, they're not necessarily going to be scholars. That's right. Um, you know, what would you say to them? What's the practical aspect of what we're doing here, what we've been doing this week? Yeah, so bottom line, the Bible is reliable and trustworthy. Okay, that's, that's what I want to say. Um, but even if you are not on some sort of academic path, right, your, your journey is to go into nursing or business or, or whatever it may be, I, I think what I just wanna impress upon you from the talks over the last couple days is that if you are a Christian here today, you, you, you trust the Bible. But that Bible didn't just fall out of heaven today, right? It didn't. The Bible that you have came to you through millennia, okay? It, it, was, it, it came to you by, by God's, first of all, miraculous divine inspiration of, of human authors. And then it came to you by, by Jewish and Christian scribes faithfully copying the text, you see. And then, ultimately, we're, we're mostly English speakers in here, I assume. It came to us by, by English translators, right? Starting with uh, John Wycliffe in the 1300s, right? Who, who uh, you know, I, I won't tell his story now, but then, then, then William Tyndale in the 1500s, who, who actually dies so that English speakers can have the Bible in their own language. Do you see what I'm saying? And, uh, and so I, I, I kind of wanted to leave you with the, the, uh, here this morning to, to, to be impressed and inspired to read the Bible because the Bible came to you through a lot of blood, sweat, toil, and tears, literally. Okay. And so, um, so, yeah, the history of the Bible, if we know something about the book, actually should cause us to read it and to study it. To, to, it should inspire us to, to dive into it more. But in any case, if you're a Christian who reads the Bible, you are, um, you are benefiting from centuries and millennia even of Bible scholars, okay? So even if you're not going to be a scholar yourself, which most of us in this room won't be, you're constantly benefiting from Bible scholars. And I think it's just good to be aware of that and appreciative of that. Anytime you take a commentary off the shelf, right, to understand a passage, there's a Bible scholar that had to write that commentary, you know what I mean? So, so big picture, we can trust the Bible um, because God has providentially given it to us, but he's also used many, many human beings along the way to get us the Bible that we have today. So that's the, that's the big takeaway, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, that's really helpful. And, yeah. you know, sometimes maybe we take for granted the fact that we have a copy of the Bible that we can, yeah. we can read. Yeah. But... Yeah. It's been this process by which it's come to us today. That's right. And we shouldn't take that lightly. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we do God less honor and the human beings less honor that have given us the Bible mm -hmm. if we just sort of take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. No, that's, yeah. that's helpful. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's take a look at your two talks and, and, again, just try to summarize basic, basic points. Yeah. So your first talk about canon, what, what I got out of that was that um, a cannon is something that fires yeah, uh, right. shells into the air, right? That's I mean, right. Is that what yes. you're trying to tell us? I would yes. take a class from Dr. Noonan if I were you. <laughs> what? Oh. That's right. That was the main point of uh, Tuesday's talk. Maybe I missed something. <laughs> That's Sorry. Right. That's right. Yes. 
No, so, so cannon spelled with two N's, right, is the, is the implement of war, yes, the tool for destruction. Oh, okay, Yes, gotcha. yes. Okay. Uh, but cannon, yeah, yeah, cannon with one N is the, the, the list of authoritative scriptural books. Mm -hmm. So it was a talk about how we got the books that we have in our Bible, mm -hmm. right? I focused mainly on the Old Testament. Um, there are 39 books in our Old Testament, right? But... Traditionally, Jews and early Christians numbered those as 22 and 24 books, right? Okay. Uh, 30, but they're the same 39 books. We have to think about it from this angle. Let's just take the 12 minor prophets from, for an example. Uh, we, we number those books, Hosea, Haggai, Malachi. We number all those books individually. But Jews were writing and copying all of those short prophetic oracles on one scroll, and therefore it was counted as one book. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so same thing with like 1st, 2nd Samuel. All those books can be counted as one. And by the time you do that math, the number boils down to, to 22, you see. But they're actually the same 39 books that are in our Old Testament. So I just, I, I did want to make that clear here this morning. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. No, that, that's certainly a good clarification there. Yeah. Now, again, just real quick summary. Yeah. There are a lot of people out there you were mentioning different books or news articles, that kind of thing. Yes. People saying, we can't trust the books of the Bible as they were given to us because they were just selected by people. That's right. What would you say to that? Again, short answer. Yeah, short answer. So, so there's, there's some sensationalism out there, okay? And I think it's seeped into some scholarship as well. What I mean is uh, uh, an overstating of the facts and the evidence that we have. In its worst form, uh, how many have heard of Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code? Okay, yeah. Last time I checked on Google, that's, that's up to like 83 million copies sold, okay, or something like this. And then, of course, it was made into a movie a few years after that. And uh, lots and lots of confusion about the history of the Bible introduced at this point, because that book more clearly and anywhere else talks about this selection process. And, and in particular, it talks about how 80 different Gospels were taken out of the Bible in the 4th century. There were lots of different Gospels, for example, more than just the four that we have in our Bible. But the way Dan Brown spins it is that those 80 other uh, apocryphal Gospels were taken out, like they were like Christians that had them originally. Okay, that has caused a lot of different confusion. And the, the particular mechanism by, that, that those books were taken out was at a council at Nicaea. And so this council is what's responsible for the Bible that you have today. Well, the fact is, none of that is rooted in any history. None of it at all. It's not a, it wasn't a picking and choosing. What the early Christians were doing is, that, is they were actually passing on the books that they had received from the apostles, you see. A traditional explanation of how we got the Bible is far better than anything like a council settling the Bible. So I hope that's helpful. Um, is there anything, any kind of follow-up on that? So, uh, yeah, so just to me, yeah, selection, picking and choosing, no early Christian would say that's how they got their Bible. Early Christians would say they got their scriptures because the apostles passed them down, and they had learned to recognize God's voice, so to speak, in those books and in no others, you see. They learned to, to recognize the voice of their shepherd in, those, in the canonical books, not in books outside of the canon. So ultimately, it comes down to the books themselves having this strange or special or peculiar qualities of divine inspiration, uh, and no other books having that, that peculiar quality, okay, if that makes sense. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because it's a little yeah. bit of an unusual phrase. So what do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, guess, I guess all we're trying to say, all I'm trying to convey is what early Christians tried to talk about as the, the apostolic ness, okay, of these New Testament documents. They could look at these biblical texts and find peculiar aspects in them, peculiar messages, truths that weren't found anywhere else. 
Um, so unique is really what you mean. Unique by that. is yeah, unique, unique in is, the sense that it comes from God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and they clearly differentiated that. Yeah, that's right. That's what those quotes I was giving you, kind of the last two days from Augustine, were saying. There's a there's a clear dividing line between the canonical books as supreme authority, as sacredly peculiar, right? Sacredly unique and strange, versus any other. Christian writing that came afterwards. Do you see that? He called that the, the dividing line. He clearly thinks the canon was closed with the period of the apostles, you see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's what we mean by that. Okay. Yeah. So, in other words, there's, a, there, there's this whole debate about whether the church created the Bible or the Word or of God. Constantine. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. right. Or whether the Word of God created the church, do you see? Augustine is saying that the books themselves already contained the peculiarness, already contained the sacredness, the, the divine inspiration, you see. And, that, and therefore, those are the books that created the church, you see. Mm -hmm. So it sounds very Protestant, but actually Augustine is laying down these doctrines a thousand years earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So basically, because people are simply recognizing that these books are God's word, that's it. You know, they're recognizing, they're not deciding this, That's they're not making them. Yeah, they're not making them God's biblical. Word. They're kind of already biblical, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah. Did, did they, John, did they speak out at all about those other books? Like, part, you mentioned the Gospels. Did, yeah. they, did they actually address those Gospels as other? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they did. Um, yeah, I thought about giving you a quote from a, another lesser-known church father named Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril talks about this Gospel of Thomas. And he talks about it as a forgery. He talks about it as being written by the, late, the early uh, philosophical group known as the Manichaeans. Uh, so having nothing to do with Christianity, you see. Uh, Athanasius has a wonderful description of how uh, some groups wrote these other gospels, wrote these other books. They actually uh, sewed time into them. That is, they made them appear older than they are uh, as part of their forgery. <laughs> So yes, they had lots of comments about those other Gospels. But, but even earlier, I should say this, not all Christians just sort of rejected them outright. Origen, the church father in Alexandria, Egypt, he read the Gospels. He actually says he's read all of them, lest someone else thinks he knows something. Hmm. Right? And so the, the, the scholars on the stage get what that means. Like it's just this, this, it's this notion that no one was going no to surprise Origen with a gospel that, that he hadn't read. He had read them all, and he goes on and he lists about, I don't know, five to eight others in, in this uh, particular text. So, so early Christians did read them. They knew what was in them, and therefore they also were in a position to say, they're just not authentic. The church has never uh, possessed these as its canonical books. So and that is that... Is that something we should do today then as Christians? Should we read the Apocrypha? Yeah, so, so I think we, we could. You know, there's, no, there's, no imper there's no command to do so, but, but I think I want to say this. Don't be afraid to read these other books. Get to know them. That's, I put those quotes from the Gospel of Thomas on there because most people just don't know what's in them. right? But that first saying I put up pictures, pictures Jesus as standing against the Old Testament. right? Gospel of Thomas 52. And anyone who knows the four Gospels goes, well, that's really different. Because Jesus doesn't talk that way about the Old Testament in the four Gospels in our Bible. So you can kind of see the differences, right? And then, of course, I'm sure, you know, if you were here on Tuesday, then you do know about the statement Jesus makes about making Mary a male so that she can be a, a, a disciple and, a, and an heir of life, you know. I mean, these are just bizarre things. Well, Think about how Jesus relates to women in the Gospels. What, what I find so interesting about that, yeah. what you're saying about like origin, is how today when guys come along and they, they kind of, they, they make it so sensational, like mm -hmm. there are other Gospels that the church exactly. is hidden from. You. Yes, exactly. And trying to destroy faith. That's right. That's right. And yet you look back at ancient church history and it's like they weren't, they weren't surprised by this. No, yeah. no. They, they weren't like worried no. and hashing around about That's that. That's exactly right. There's no secret Bible. There's yeah. no hidden Bible. But you'll hear those expressions out there in the culture today. Yeah, that's right. But, but the church history, Christian history shows us we've known about these for centuries. Yeah, that's great. Good point. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your second talk, which you gave yesterday. Yeah. Again, try to summarize some of the key points there. Yeah. You're basically talking about how the Bible was copied and came to us today. Yes. Um, so I think one of the most important points that we want to make clear up front is that we don't have any of those original copies of the Bible, right? That's right. And so that's why this is an issue. That's right. Now, again, short, short answer. Yeah. Why can we trust the copies that we have today? Yeah. They're old, and we have many of them. Okay? That's the shortest answer I can give. Mm -hmm. That's pretty short. Yeah, that's pretty short. Mm -hmm. Scholarship on these remaining manuscripts shows that the text of the Old Testament and of the New has been preserved extremely well through history. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean there aren't significant variants. There are. What do you mean by a variant? So differences in the copies, differences in the manuscripts, okay. ones that affect our translations, for example. Right? So one of the things you have to ask, because um, I know I'm going to get this question later on. I might as well just jump the gun here. Like, what English translation should I read? Right? This is always the, the question. <laughs> and, uh, and I always say many, or a couple at least, because if you read one English translation... Uh, alongside another, you're going to see differences sometimes across these, 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 these versions. And it's not always due to differences in translation philosophy. It's not always due in, uh, to differences of, well, this one's just a more word-for-word -word literal translation, while this one's a more thought-for-thought, -thought, you know, dynamic translation or something like that. Sometimes, Different English translators have chose to translate different manuscripts at different times. And, and the good English translations will actually put those in footnotes at the bottom. I don't know. Does everyone read footnotes in their Bible? Do you guys read footnotes in your Bible? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes. I will say it wasn't, it's not really until the last 15 years of my life that I've really started paying attention to footnotes mm. in my English Bible. They're, yeah. they're actually important, aren't they? They are important. They, mm -hmm. signal, they signal important issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so um, this is not, but I guess here's the point, though. What I want to do is I want to say scholars who overstate the case, you can't live according to the Bible according to the faith and ethics of the Bible, because there's so many differences in our manuscripts, right? There's that extreme that gets sensationalized in the news and sometimes in our university halls. Then there's another overreaction. There's another overplaying of our theology of Scripture where we make the evidence fit a pristine a uh, pristinely preserved Bible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so there are some systematic theologies, uh, especially if they're, uh, you know, say older, like, like, like 50 to 100 years older, that don't, they're not aware of all the differences all the time, you see. And so, so there can be two, two kind of extremes out here. We want to inhabit the middle, okay? We want to inhabit, a, 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 I think, a world that says, Providence governed humans and all the messiness there in giving us the Bible today, the Bible that we need that's sufficient for salvation today. And then we want to we ignore the other extreme that kind of says the Bible really is not part of history <laughs> or something like this. And somehow it's just sort of immune to every human process or something like that because that's not quite right. So we need to kind of think about how do we... How do we inhabit this middle space? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned something there, which I think, is, I think is helpful, this idea of providence. Yes. But I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding this because I thought Providence was the capital of Rhode Island, right? That's right. That's right. It's a tiny state. I'm sorry for all the bad jokes here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what, what is that? It's, yeah. it's maybe a word that we use as Christians. That's right. Um, but what do we mean by that? And, yeah. And unpack that for us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, Ben, can I, can I read just a little bit here? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And I promise it's not my own words. I actually want to just quote C.S. Lewis. Oh, definitely that. Okay, definitely. I want to quote C.S. Lewis on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, great. So um, in the conclusion to this book, we're trying to show, after laying out a history to how we got the Bible, we then want to show how God's providence intersects with this. 
So C.S. Lewis explained that God's, ex- so by, he, he, he's talking about how extraordinary acts are often followed by ordinary ones. Okay, that's the point here. So Lewis explained this two-step pattern in his study of miracles, and here I'm quoting him. Miraculous wine, right, from John 2, for example, miraculous wine will intoxicate. Yeah, so, so here's the miracle of turning water into wine. I heard that, I heard that. Are we allowed to talk about wine up here? I don't no. know. Yeah. Go ahead. 20 it's years right. ago, certainly not. <laughs> miraculous wine will intoxicate. So there it is, right? You have a, a miracle that actually leads to the ordinary process of intoxication. Then he says, miraculous conception will lead to pregnancy, right? So the virgin conception, right, led to the not-so-miraculous virgin birth. Then he says, inspired books, like of Scripture, will suffer all the ordinary processes of textual corruption. Miraculous bread will be digested. The divine art of miracle is not an art of suspending the pattern to which events conform, but of feeding new events into that pattern. Right? So that's, I think that's really fascinating. So Mary's conception of Jesus was quite unusual, but her pain in delivering him was not. In a similar way, the Bible's inspiration was an extraordinary new event fed into God's ordinary way. This is what we're calling providence. The providential way of working in the world. That ordinary way extends all the way from early canon lists to our modern Bibles, from ancient Jewish scribes to modern textual criticism, from an ancient translation to a modern English one. Our trust in the result is not diminished because the means are sometimes messy. To fully appreciate the Bible's history and God's involvement in it requires this robust doctrine of providence, you see. What we're saying is there's a miracle in the inspiration of Scripture. But once that book is inspired and produced, it is then preserved through more ordinary providential means. That's, that's what we're trying to, to lay out here. Um, J.I. Packer has a, has a good analogy for divine sovereignty and providence. It's like, a, it's like we're free to move about on a cruise liner or a ship, but that ship, God is moving in the direction that he wants to, you see. And I, I, tend, to think of, I tend to think of scribes through this lens. Scribes are copying. They are ultimately producing what God wants produced, but there are some, there, there's room for, for human error, for example, on, on that. So, yeah. Good. And it makes me think, too, I mean, just as we're talking about this, and so you're talking about how God is sovereign over history. Yeah, yeah. He's given us his Bible, his word, um, and yet he uses human people, yeah. and we're fallible, we're, we're sinful, yeah. uh, we make mistakes. We're lazy. Um, and yet we can still trust that process, yeah. you know, because he's preserved his word over the years. Um, but that gives me confidence, I think, for how we understand the Bible today, right? I can trust it. That's right. But I think it also helps me, too, because it reminds me that God is at work even now yes. in history, That's just right. as he was then, right? Correct. This isn't just something we're talking about back then, right? but we can talk about even now, and maybe even when it comes to people who are translating the Bible, right? That's right. You think that, um, yep. you know, how would you see it coming into play yeah. when it comes to modern translation? No, exactly. Scribes and scripture, right, it continues, right? This is something that's, that uh, we also try to show in the book. It's, uh, we have the Bible today, yes, because of God's sovereign orchestration, but we also have the Bible because humans took responsibility for it, right? And in particular, humans of faith, right? Jews and Christians took responsibility for it. So, yeah, I think we're kind of in a similar place. Not, not just in the producing of New English translations, I'll talk about that in a second, but y'all in reading it, in studying it, in teaching it, in being taught from it, you see. The Bible is not the tack on here. This is the authority of Scripture week here at CIU. I love this week. This is my first week doing this, but I love this. I love this because... It was, like I said in my first talk, it was always a pillar of the ethos when I was here. And every student walked away from here going, the Bible is the final infallible authority in my life. 
And, um, and as culture has continued to slide in the directions that it has, the only unwavering authority in the culture today is the Scriptures, the Word of God. Does that make sense? And you're going to have to consult it and, and submit to it and live by it. It may sound very different to you from, than the voices you're hearing from culture. That's what Augustine was saying in around 400 AD. I come to something and it perplexes me. And that, per, that, that, that perplexity, I think, comes from because it was dissonant. It was different than other things he was hearing from the Roman Empire at the time. But his stance in front of it before Scripture was to be under it, was to be humble before it, and was to second-guess his own understanding of it before he would doubt what was written in front of him. So this week, I, hope, I, I really hope I've impressed that upon you. John, that's so, that's so good. Yeah. Uh, you know, just what we were talking about with the Gospels and how the early church saw those other Gospels in the same way, you know, we're, we're really not living in a new, new time as right. much as we think we are. That's right. Mm -hmm. We're living in, a, in kind of an awakening of pagan yeah. culture again. That's right. And yet we can look back at guys like Augustine who, who did sit and hear the voice of Jesus That's right. through the Word of God Correct. as a model for us today. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. We, there's nothing new under the sun. That's right. Let's go to the Old Testament for a second. Yeah. There, there is go. nothing new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes teaches us. And, uh, and I think this is it. Are we going to listen to God as he's revealed himself in his word? Or are we going to listen to the culture? That's really, that's, that's the decision that's been before God's people from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, maybe I should, do you want me to say something about scholarship now and how that works? Just a little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Do that. yeah, sure. yeah. So, um, so scribes in Scripture, the story continues. We, ha we continue to have a Bible that's, that's faithfully studied, right, according to its manuscripts, faithfully translated, hopefully, right, meeting people where they're at. So, so we could talk about the difficult work of translators, right, as they're trying to navigate how am I faithful to the source, the Hebrew and Greek source, uh, or, right, that, that's one tension point. And the other tension point is, how am I faithful to communicate with the meaning of the Scriptures, right, to people who live in the year of 2023, right? That's, that's the big tension. And, um, I mean, we have, there's some quotes in this book, of, like from Martin Luther, right? He, 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 he wanted to make sure that his German readers of the Bible um, uh, that when they read Moses, they wanted to see Moses, he wanted them to see Moses more as a German than a Jew. I know this side of the Holocaust, that's kind of scary, but, but he, he's not really talking about uh, Jews per se, just, just Hebrew idioms in the, in the Old Testament. But he want, what he really wanted was ger were German Christians to be able to read Moses, uh, but not as an ancient Hebrew, but as like a, a modern German in that context. Does that make sense? So, in other words, he really cared about the message coming forth, right, uh, in his German translation. Uh, we have translations with that philosophy today, like the NIV works that way. The message works even more like that. Um, you know, things, things like that. Um, but, of course, the, there's, other, there's other translations that drag us more into the world of the Bible, like the NASB and the ESV, uh, etc., so, but we're dependent. We're dependent on, on academics at that point, on scholars to help us go through all of that primary data and information in order that we can have the Word of God in our language. And in our case, we're, we're, we're uber blessed here with just multiple English translations to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why at least the academic side of things is important, right? Being yes. aware of these kinds of issues, whether that's where you are or not. That's right. Um, whether you're going to be a scholar on this or not. Yes. It's important um, yes. to know that there are good people who are doing this kind of work. Um, that's right. And that we can use their translations, um, but also to know that we can trust that God has preserved his word. That's right. Over the centuries for us as well. Yeah, amen. And, and I think that's, 
I think that's a good place, maybe just because we're we're coming up on the end of our time here. Yeah. Again, just a, a final final takeaway. Yeah. If I say to you, okay, what do you want everybody here to take away from your time this week? <laughs> what would you say? Yeah. Don't use the Bible's history as a way to doubt it. Rather, lean into the Bible's history as a way to inspire you to keep reading it, to keep following God's voice within it, and to, and to, keep, and to, main, uh, to continue being disciples of Jesus Christ. The Bible's history is fascinating, intriguing. It should cause us and inspire us to want to know more about the Bible and what's in it as opposed to causing us to run away from it. That's, that would be what I would hope we'd take away from this today. Mm -hmm. yeah. So really good words, really good words. Mm -hmm. John, uh, thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annie, for coming and supporting yep. John. Mm -hmm. Just maybe thank you one more time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, would you be willing to just pray a blessing over these students? Yeah and close us out in yeah. prayer that way? Yeah, let's pray. Our Father, our God, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. I'm so thankful for Columbia International University, your, your gracious and merciful hand upon this institution for a hundred years. And for a century, it has had pillars that have been instilled in all the students who have darkened the doors of this place. I pray for this, this class right here, this generation right here, who has many, many challenges facing it in terms of what the culture is teaching, what, uh, what even the church, sections of the church are teaching that are contrary to the Word of God. Father, I pray that you would make their hearts strong, that their minds would be sound, that they would cling to your word as the living word of God, that they would point them to Jesus Christ, their king, and that they would remain loyal subjects to him, and that they would be devoted to making him known in the rest of this world. I pray for the rest of this prayer day that you would use it impactfully in their lives, that they would continue to lean into you, to press into you, O oh God. Rest in your grace and mercy. May your spirit continue to sanctify each and every one in here. May we all honor you with the rest of our lives. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen.